Zivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for updates on podcast guests and lots of live events. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I hope that you have had a chance to check out We Found Time, wefoundtime.com, my new online magazine. We have such amazing essays out this week, and I really hope you'll take the time to go read them or send them to friends or see what you think. And I'd love your feedback if you have any thoughts. All the essays on We Found Time are written by authors who have been on this podcast already. So it's original content and I think it's really awesome. So I really hope you'll check it out. This week's sponsor is Nini's Treats, which is my in-laws crumb cake business. And it is so good. And they had gone on hiatus for a little while and they're back in business now, stronger than ever. And it's the best crumb cake in all different flavors. And you can order it on goldbelly.com. And their brand is called Nini's Treats. Nini is my husband Kyle's grandmother, N-E-N-E apostrophe S, Nini's Treats. And you just search it on Gold Belly and they have this amazing black and white crumb cake and a regular crumb cake. And anyway, it's really delicious. And for everybody who is at home and going stir crazy, um, it will ship really quickly and fresh and you can freeze it if you don't want to eat it right away. So anyway, ninistreats.com or go buy it on goldbelly.com. Today, I'm on Skype with Amy Fish, who's the author of I Wanted Fries With That, How to Ask for What You Want and Get What You Need. She is the ombudsperson, also known as the chief complaints officer at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, and regularly teaches, speaks, and writes about how to complain effectively. Her work has been published in Reader's Digest, Hippocampus Magazine, Costco Magazine, HuffPost, and several other publications. She currently lives in Montreal. Welcome, Amy. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Could you please tell listeners what I Wanted Fries With That is about and also how you came up with that fabulous title? Sure. The book I Wanted Fries With That is about how do you ask for what you want and get what you need. There are 27 chapters. It starts off with little things, how to get greener lettuce, and we work up to the bigger things like how to get the right break at work or how to negotiate with your spouse. How did you become like the chief complaint officer in life? Like, how did you know that was something you would be good at? How did you get there? I'm always fascinated by people getting these really cool, perfect jobs and how they even knew they were around, you know? This is a really good story. I told it at my book launch, actually, which is that I was working with my history is in healthcare. I've always worked in healthcare. I have a master's in health and men. And my husband was selling soap. He decided to start his own business. And so I went in the office to help him and I was doing collections on the phone. And after a few years, thankfully the business did well and outgrew my non-expertise. And I said to him, listen, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go back to my own career, but it's going to take me a really long time because because quality in healthcare, it's such a narrow field. And so the next day I was putting down newspaper for my kids to paint. This was a long time ago. Right? <laughs> and I put the career section down and I saw an ad for an ombudsman at a Jewish nursing home. And it was here in Montreal. They were looking for someone bilingual, English and French. They were looking for someone with a degree in health admin. They were looking for someone from the Jewish community. And Zibby, it practically had my picture. I mean, it was <laughs> all of my qualifications. And I said, ombudsman, that's interesting. I'm going to try it. And I went for the interview and within a week I had a new job. Wow. Something yeah. just like fall into your lap, right? You can't ignore the signs. Yeah. <laughs> and I learned the, really, I learned how to do it on the job, but I realized right away that it was a hand in a glove and it was a great fit for me. And so your job dovetailed with your ability, natural ability to sort of speak up for yourself. And then you've shared this expertise with all of us now in this fantastic book, which I thought was so brilliant. You organized by the complaint, which is just, I love like when the structure of books is a little bit like a wink, wink, you know? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it was hard to decide how to do it, right? Because I could have organized it by skill set, but I think this lent me the opportunity to be a little funnier, mm-hmm. like how to, you know, keep your, keep someone alive when complaining or how to get on the Ferris wheel. Like it, it was a little, it gave me a little more opportunity for humor. So when did you know you had a book in you? This is actually my second book. My first book is called The Art of Complaining, and it was a similar idea, but more of a gift book. I've been blogging since 2011, and my great uncle, 
may he rest in peace, was a philanthropist. And he said to me, you have so much to say. Like, why don't you write a book and I'll publish it? And I knew nothing about books. So I sat down at my computer and wrote a book and, and handed it to him. <laughs> Well, that works. <laughs> and, he, and he published my 12,000 word little book. And then it ended up doing really, really well, Knockwood. The deal I had with him was that I was not allowed to make money off the book. Anything that I made had to be given away to charity. And so I ended up with 2,500 books in my garage. And I was like, what am I going to do now? And I just had no knowledge. Like I had no idea what the publishing industry was, what an agent was. I knew nothing. And I just got on the phone and started booking myself on spe- doing a lot of public speaking and a lot of touring and getting rid of the books. That's how I looked at it. Wow. And then that's how I became a writer. So then after that, I started going to writing conferences and learning about writing and writing columns and doing more and more writing. And then that's how it all came together. And you got rid of all the books. Oh yeah, easily. It ended up that distribution was my biggest problem because everybody wanted the books. I was so lucky. So I had books in my car. I had books in my in my purse. I was like in the grocery store and people were like, aren't you the one that wrote that book? I'm like, sure, here you go. <laughs> Pay it forward. Or they would give me money and I'd just give it to the next charity that I bumped into. Wow, that's so nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Are you doing something similar with this book? Well, with this book, it's a different situation because I have a publisher and it's more formal. But I knew that that's what I wanted just because I'm not very good at logistics and I didn't want the headache of having to track on Amazon and ship. And I'm just not talented that way. And I would for sure be miss shipping everything and my books would be all wrong. And I I have no, I'm like the Lucille Ball of of office management. (laughs) (laughs) I have no skills in that area. So why do people not stick up for themselves? Why do people need your book? Which they obviously really, really do, both your books. Like what is wrong with us that we can't say what we need? Oh, wrong with us is strong. I think a lot of us are reluctant because we don't know how. That's what I really believe. And I think that if you start with the smaller things, you really can build up the muscle so that when it's more difficult to complain, you're used to it and you have your voice ready and you're less intimidated. I think a lot of us don't want to make waves. We don't want to cause trouble. I think we want to be liked and we want to be friends with everybody. But we have to remember that when we're standing up for something, it's not only for ourselves. It's everyone in line behind you whose life is going to get better because you spoke up. And I tell this to people all the time who come to me for advice. If you do nothing, then nothing's ever going to change. And that's my nightmare. So that's why I wrote the book. Wow. Well, thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) You have some really good tips. And one of the chapters I liked the most was how to get somebody to stop using their cell phone at the dinner table, because we have (laughs) sort of a recurrent issue with that, with two tweens and, you know, my husband and everybody else. So yeah. what what is the secret to getting somebody you're with to stop using their phone at the table? First of all, you can't use your phone at the table. I'm good. I don't. I use table. it everywhere else, but that is the <laughs> one place I put it down. Well, my story there is really about negotiation and finding something you could live with. And so it maybe it's not realistic to have every single meal phone free, at least at the beginning, but you could probably negotiate for a couple of meals a week. So what I suggest is coming up with what you could live with. Let's say it's three meals a week, no phone. And then on the other nights, you say nothing because you got your way on the three nights, right? If that doesn't work for your family, then I would also try it with a timer. So 15 minutes phone free or 20 minutes phone free. And then you could have your phone at the end of dinner or at dessert or, you know, whatever works in your particular situation. Lately, I've been using the timer just to keep people at the table for that long. I was like, can we do eight minutes, all of us sitting down? (laughs) Let's go for 10. (laughs) And a lot of the book is about communication. Well, I mean, a lot of it is communication, but even between, even when it's not yourself, you're sticking up for. So the example you gave with the mother who only, who brought a giant cupcake at a birthday party for her child. And then the rest of the kids, she didn't bring cupcakes for. Tell me about that. Tell me about that one. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. No. So we're at a birthday party and I think the kid was turning three and it comes time for the birthday cake to come out. And the mom brings a giant cupcake that almost looked like a cake, icing dripping everywhere and puts it in front of her kid and then passes around dry bakery cookies. I'm not sure if you have them in New York, but do you have a visual on them? They're almost like the chocolate chips are sitting on top. They're not the delicious Toll House cookies and passes those around for the other kids. And the kids start crying because they don't understand what's happening. And so you have a little tiny table with all the 
little chairs and all the kids pointing at the cupcake and going nuts. And I thought, I have to tell this woman that that's not appropriate, but I can't tell her now in front of everybody. So in my mind, I was helping her. I thought, I'm going to make this situation better for her so she doesn't make this mistake again. That's what was in my head. And so I waited till everyone had left. And I just gently went over to her and I said, look, I know this is your first kid. This is my third. And you really have to bring the same treat for everybody. But what I didn't know, Zibby, is that this poor mom was hanging on by a thread. And my comment to her was just the last straw. Oh, no. And she, yes. And she took the cupcake and she threw it, the rest of it, in the trash and said, there, now are you happy? And words were exchanged. And I felt terrible. But on the other hand, I thought, well, I did everything I could to kind of make it better in the sense that I didn't go on and on on social media about her. I didn't talk behind her back. I waited till everyone was gone. I was as gentle as I could be. And you know what? I'm not sure if it was a mistake or not. I left with a giant question mark. Years later, I'm sitting in the movies and who sits next to me but this woman? And I joke in the book that I start rifling through my bag for dark sunglasses because I'm so <laughs> embarrassed. I just want to disguise. But she just said, I just really wanted to thank you. You know, I was having a dark day, but you were 100 percent right. And I did the wrong thing and I should have known better. And you taught me a valuable lesson that day. Wow. Don't you feel like so much of the behavior that comes out of people that's so awful is really just when they're the ones having the worst days of their lives. And that's, yeah. it's not that they're bad people. Like, and if you just can tap into that, it kind of, makes it all better? Yeah. I think finding compassion is really key to getting along with people. That's a much better way to say what I was just trying to say. Thank you. <laughs> what about people who are running late? Because this is another, you have tips for this as well. Well, my number one tip for when someone is running late is that it's not fixable by you. And no alarm clock that you're going to get them or no gadget that's going to help them organize their keys is going to help get them out the door on time to meet you. So I, that is where I talk about the serenity prayer, which is accepting the things you can change and knowing what you can't change and knowing the difference. I think it's not in front of me, but it's a very beautiful quote that has always resonated with me because I can't make you on time. And that's the story in the book where someone has a family member who's always, always late and it drives her crazy, but she can control what time dinner starts. So if you invite people to your house and you have a recurring family event, let's say Passover is coming up and every year you have the Seder or you have your Easter dinner, or whatever your family celebrates, spring solstice, and people are always late, then you don't have to wait for them. You can start dinner when you start dinner. And that's how you cope with someone who's always late. You don't change them. You just decide what you're willing to live with and what you're not willing to live with. Okay. What about like the fake time? I don't think it works. No. I know. I mean, look, whenever people have other solution alternatives to what I suggest, I always say like, if it's working for you, you don't need me, right? Like if you have set up a fake time and you have a girlfriend who's always late for lunch and so you just always tell her 30 minutes early and it always works, then great. It doesn't always but, work. That's why I need you. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just think it's more about like, if I'm going to have lunch with that person, I have a decision to make. Either I'm going to bring some work with me and I'm going to sit and wait for them, or I'm going to tell them to pick me up on their way so that I'm not stuck waiting, or I'm going to do something to modify the situation so that it's not final warnings and frustration because something internally is making them late. And it's not for us to psychoanalyze and we're not going to be able to resolve it. So we just have to figure out the best way to work around it with the least amount of aggravation for us. This is all very wise advice. Thank you. <laughs> you mentioned in the book that you used to go to Weight Watchers, which I did for years and years, which I don't even know why I bothered because, <laughs> you know, it all came back after I my passionate, you know, five year stint. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, I don't even remember talking about it in the book. That's funny. But me and weight is like longer than a podcast. That's a journey <laughs> that <laughs> we can we could go on a retreat and discuss. That's just very long. And I guess at some point I must have been on Weight Watchers. I was very young the first time. I think I was in fifth grade the first time I went on Weight Watchers. And then there was a certain extra allotment, like I got an extra cup of milk or something in those days. But I was, I don't even remember talking about it. Huh, that's funny. Yeah. Well, I I feel like I have an extra sensory, like, you know, detector for that since it's something I lived with, with for so long. So yeah. yeah. So you also, just to switch like tones a little bit, most of your book was hilarious, but then you also referenced how you had lost over a hundred people in your family and your extended family during the Holocaust. And that's a lot mm -hmm. of people to know that you had lost. So I just wanted to talk to you yes. about that and what part of your family and, you know, tell me a little more. Yeah. Sure. My dad's family, so my 
Bobby and my Zadie, both my grandparents, had lost siblings and also siblings that were married and had children. And then that entire branch of the family almost got, almost wiped out. So two brothers escaped to Israel. One saw his wife and children perish, watched. And the other one, they were separated. And they somehow made it to what was Palestine at the time and became Israel for the course of, for the purpose of this conversation. So they were there when Israel was declared a state and they were part of the original, original settlers. And then my grandparents came to Montreal and then there are some that ended up in South America. Hmm. Where were they from originally? From Poland. Wow. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps as a result or not related, you said in the book how you really make a point of celebrating Shabbat dinner every Friday night if you're not like at Disney on Ice concert or something. <laughs> so what do you think are the best parts about, about that ritual for you in your life? Well, actually, I can tell you where it came from. When I was pregnant with Ezra, who's my oldest, he's 20 now, I had a very difficult time. I was in and out of the hospital. I was really sick. And I made a pledge that if I make it and this baby makes it, I will make Shabbat every week. Wow. And I've almost not missed Like, almost not. Like, I could probably less than 10 times. I'm really strict about it, even if we're away. Or even if, like, we've been known to bring a challah into a restaurant. If it's that kind of week where we're just not going to get to dinner. And for sure, my kids have to be home for Shabbat, for sure, 100%. They're allowed to bring people, but for sure, Friday night is mine, no matter what. That's smart. Way to to claim that early. Yes. (laughs) So it's always been like that, because that's my oldest kid, so that they've grown up. So the most important thing to me is that's when for sure we see my sister and her family and my dad if he's around. And that's the most important part that the cousins grow up together. It's just me and my sister. So that the cousins all all grow up together and that they're used to seeing each other every Friday. That's the most important thing for us. That's so nice. Yeah. I remember once ending up at a hotel in Vegas and it was like four o'clock and I was like, (laughs) I called down and I was like, I'm going to need a holla. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was a uh, did they do it for you they did it it wasn't exactly what I would call a holla but it was close <laughs> enough you know and they were deeply yeah. apologetic about the whole thing how could we not find it I'm like you have every cuisine in the in the world here just one loaf of bread <laughs> that's <laughs> funny I've, I've been like we were once on a cruise and I made them go to the Chabad cruise Friday night like I, I'm really not nice about it <laughs> <laughs> you know like there were there was a sign like for uh, for Jewish people they're doing services and I made everybody come to services and have dinner. I feel like I do not want to be on your bad side. I feel like you make people do what you want to do and I am going to just like coast along with this type oh, of that's funny. pleasant My relationship. My husband says that too. He says that to me all the time. I don't want to be on your bad side. But usually I'm very gentle and you don't even realize it's happening. <laughs> I, I would, I, I'm not surprised about that either. <laughs> so when you're writing, where do you like to write? I'm, we're doing Skype and I'm looking at you in, I think, your office. Is that where you yeah, like to do you your, is that where you work? Or do you like to go out to coffee shops or what's your, what's your ritual? My ritual for this particular book for I Wanted Fries with that was I wrote in bursts. So I bought an apartment or I bought my dad's country house and I just went 24 hours, right, sleep, right, sleep, right, sleep. And then I came home. That's how I did it because my timeline was very, very tight for this book. I only had a few months and I was working full time during the whole thing, plus the kids. So the only way I could figure out to do it was in these really intense moments. In general, if I'm working on an essay or doing research, then I could write at my desk or in a coffee shop. And did you like the process? Like, you know, you've written two books. Do you, yeah. do you want to do more? Is, are you like, this yeah. is what I love to okay, do? Yeah. Yes. hundred percent. I would love to do more. I'd love to write a, a narrative. Like I want, would like to do something a bit different, not necessarily a self-help or prescriptive nonfiction, but something with more of an arc. Okay. A narrative arc. Yes. I feel like you And I am actually interested in the Holocaust. So it's funny that you brought that up. I know it's a very popular topic right now, but that kind of theme piques my interest. Yeah. Well, it's so personal. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know I feel like I'm like, I can't accept another historical fiction (laughs) novel about the Holocaust. I have like 57 or anyway. Oh yeah. No, but then you never know because then one is really good. But um. right. (laughs) (laughs) So what is coming next for you now? Like, what do you want to do next? Well, right now I'm still promoting fries and loving doing that. And I'm still 
still talking about fries a lot. And I'm just, like I said, researching what my next thing is going to be. I'm going to be starting a new writing workshop this week. As a, I'm a student, I'm going to be taking a writing class called Narrative Nonfiction. So I'm hoping that with that and kind of the themes and what I've been reading, somehow magically a project will emerge. If you say it will, it will. <laughs> <laughs> did you do for the publicity for this book, did you do any tie-ins with like any sort of fast food or fry places or anything like that? <laughs> That's funny. I didn't specifically, but wherever I went, people got fries, like at a lot of the talks people served fries or had fries on display, which was really cute. Are you now sick of fries? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the point of the fries title was because my when I was 14, we were allowed to leave campus for lunch. And my friend Julie went and ordered fries at the counter and they never came. And she said, I ordered the fries, but I'm not sure if they heard me. And we're all still friends. And so So for the past 35 years, we've all been using this expression to mean standing up for yourself. And so for me, the theme and the title were more about standing up for yourself than the actual French fries, if that makes sense. So if there's a girl out there, let's just say as an example, who is just really struggling with being able to get the words out and and be assertive and stand up for what she wants, what advice would you have for her? My advice would be you have to start. Even if it's not perfect, you have a better chance of changing things if you open your mouth. But if you don't say anything, then nothing is ever going to change. And do you have any advice for aspiring authors? You know, the advice that someone gave me was you just have to write. And I didn't think it was fair advice because if I knew how to write, then I would have probably been doing it. So I think my advice for aspiring authors would be if you're interested in a lot of different projects and you're not sure what to work on, just start brainstorming and making lists and write easy things. Lists are easy to write. Or how was your day? Journaling are easy. Those are easy things to write and just get in the habit of exercising those muscles so that when you're ready to be an author, you'll have the skills and your voice will, you'll learn your voice. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing your advice and your great stories with everybody from Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. So thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zibby Owens. Please make sure to sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com to get more updates about episodes like these and also lots of live events. Thanks so much for listening today. Again, please go check out wefoundtime.com, wefoundtime.com for this week's new five essays from authors who have been in the podcast and also go to goldbelly.com and order some Nini's Treats crumb cakes. They are so good and you will not regret it, although your clothes might be a little tight next week. Um, I hope you all have a great week. Bye-bye. Thanks. You can follow me on Instagram at moms don't have time to read books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 